So let's talk about complete obstruction of airflow. B, a stop, relatively low sonority. Rhythm, rhythm, vm. That's an R, believe me. A nasal peak. You know what? I don't, that's not an R. I can't lie to you. And I'm going to write them down. So welcome. If you're joining us on YouTube, this is going to be a video all about definitions. So you can have a place to go uh, to look at some sort of relatively canonical definitions for some technical terms that get used a lot uh, by me uh, and other linguists and conlangers. So without further ado, let's scoot over to the blackboard. Yes, we have the blackboard today. We're going to see how I do with it. And we are first going to talk about some phonology. So let's talk about obstruents and sonorants first. And I'm going to write them down. Obstruent versus sonorant. So these are two big classes of sounds. Um, the big difference between an obstruent and a sonorant is that an obstruent is made by obstructing airflow. Now that can be complete obstruction of airflow, as in the case of a stop, like I'll put vowels on either side so you can hear the consonant. Apa, ata, aka, stops, uh, or by narrowing the airflow to the point where it creates um, turbulence. So that would give us a fricative, like afa, asa, aha, these kinds of things. So these are obstruents. Another um, uh, manner of articulation that counts as obstruent is affricate. An affricate is basically a stop plus a fricative all rolled into one. So something like acha, adza, this kind of thing. So you have the, that stop onset and then the release is a fricative. So those are obstruents. Obstruents are prototypically voiceless. So they are, if you just think obstruent, probably it's going to be voiceless, although it can be voiced. It's not uncommon to have voiced obstruents like a ba, a za, a ja. Those obstruents are all voiced. Um, but sort of by default, they tend to be voiceless if you look cross linguistically. Okay, so then we can contrast obstruents. So maybe I'll just put something like stops, fricatives, and affricates all in this obstruent camp. And uh, what else do we have? We have sonorants. And so sonorants contrast with obstruents. If you're not an obstruent, then you're a sonorant. Um, sonorants are produced with continuous airflow. So uh, something like a nasal, a na, a ma, a nga, a nya, um, where airflow is uh, coming through the nasal passage, uh, liquids, a la, a ra, uh, semivowels, a ya, a wa, these are all sonorants. So we can put something like nasals, liquids, and well, we're going to have to assume that's an M, semi-vowel. Um, you can also think of a vowel as a sonorant. Some people do. Some people exclude them from the category. Some people think of sonorants only as consonants. But um, if we use our definition of unrestricted airflow, then vowels would also count. And when we're looking at uh, sonorants, they are not only prototypically voiced, but they're almost always voiced. It's very um, uncommon to have a voiceless sonorant. Of course, they do exist, um, but typologically, it is, it's fairly rare. So uh, a voiceless sonorant would be something like ma, ah, ma, or ah, hua. The hua in some varieties of English, that's in words like um, whether and whip, uh, those are, are voiceless obstruents. So that's the obstruent sonorant deal. And I am going to look at the chat, just make sure. Oh, clicks, that's a good question. Um, so my understanding would be that clicks would be um, 
if if there might be either there'd be obstruents um although i don't know very much much about clicks so don't uh don't quote me on that yet but based on the definitions um based on the definitions i think we'd be dealing with with uh obstruents there and okay so obstruents versus sonorants next i want to talk about syllables so i'm just going to delete this and it's going to go to a different color that i don't want it to be so i'm going to briefly fill that in okay super um syllables so what is a syllable there we go what is a syllable A syllable is something that people often have intuitions about, even before studying linguistics. Um, it's something that comes into play in a lot of artistic uses, uh, uses of language. And what a syllable is, is a unit of sound structure composed of a series of sounds. So, uh, you know, a kind of pre-theoretic understanding of syllables in English, the word syllable would have three syllables, and this is also... It's not just pre-theoretical. This is, I think, what most people would say. Um, you have something like syllable. But what's going on here? What are we actually counting? We're counting a series of sounds that contains a peak of sonority and the consonants that cluster around this peak. And so sonority, we've talked about sonorants. Um, sonority is the scale along which so, uh, sonorants and obstruents differ. And when we have a syllable, we're always looking for the sort of peak of sonority. So let's take an example in, uh, let's take an example in English of a, a syllable. Um, so we can probably do something like, what's a good, what's a good English? Mm, something like beauty. So, right, this is going to be our, our word, beauty. And let's look at the, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of sounds we have here. We have a stop, we have a semi-vowel, we have a vowel, we have a stop, and a vowel. And if we are to draw the sort of sonority uh, along a, just draw the sonority scale where higher is more sonorous and lower is less sonorous. Um, we would have something like this. B, a stop, relatively low sonority. Y, a sonorant, so higher sonority. And then U, a vowel, highest sonority. Um, so there are actually sub uh, distinctions within sonorants and obstruents. Some Obstruents are more sonorous than other obstruents. Some sonorants are more sonorous than other sonorants. This is called the sonority hierarchy, um, which we won't talk about today because we'll be here forever. Uh, but just know that we have a peak of sonority here. Then we go way down for this stop, t, And then we go way back up again for the final vowel, e. Beauty. And so this is a two-syllable word because we have two peaks of sonority. Okay, so this is generally what we're counting when we're counting syllables. Um, there are, as always, exceptions in messy cases, but let's just stick to the, stick to the, the, main, the main bit. So this is a syllable. Now syllables also have, let's see if I can avoid, syllables also have structure. And so I'm going to have to try and see, I'm getting better at this gradually. I should just train on this app, but um, okay. So we have structure to syllables. So we can, we can write a syllable with a lowercase sigma like this. Syllables contain uh, two, well, they have a hierarchical structure that actually there are multiple levels to the syllable. But at the first level, under the syllable itself, we can break a syllable up into two sort of subparts. One is called the onset and one is called the rhyme. 
on set. That's an R, believe me. Rhyme. I'm, you know what? I don't, that's not an R. I can't lie to you. Rhyme. You'll also see it spelled R-I-M-E uh, sometimes. So the onset and the rhyme are the two components of a syllable. The rhyme is mandatory. And the rhyme consists of that peak of sonority as well as all of the consonants that follow it. So let's think of a more involved English word. Let's, let's think of a, a syllable that's like strengths, strengths. Um, strengths, this is the English word spelled like this, strengths. And, okay, which, where's our peak of sonority? So, S is one of these exceptions to the, uh, the principle of uh, the sonority sequencing principle. S is actually a little bit higher than T, um, but never mind. So we have something like this. And this is our syllable peak, the vowel E. So getting rid of our little diagram there. So E is going to fit into the rhyme and everything after it is also going to fit into the rhyme. So this ENGTHS is going to be the rhyme and the onset, which is optional, is going to take everything that precedes the peak in sonority. So str. So we have these two components. Um, when we look at the rhyme, one of the reasons we call it a rhyme is that this is the portion of the syllable that we look to to decide if two syllables rhyme. So not a lot of things rhyme with strengths, uh, perhaps none, uh, but if we have a word like um, a word like rose, something like this, we have so it's supposed to be oh yeah, lengths. That, that's a good example. Okay, I don't even have to go to rose. Um, but if we were to use rose, we could rhyme rose with goes, hose, etc. And they all share, if I could write it properly, they all share everything from the syllable uh, sonority peak onwards. And so that's why they rhyme. And similarly, strengths and lengths, we have, we would just exchange str or satura with la and then we have a rhyme. So that's the onset and the rhyme. Um, there are, of course, syllables without onsets. Uh, think of a good one. Um, do, 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 do. Eel, like the animal. So eel would look something like this. I think I need to get more space. Eel would look something like this. So we have the rhyme no onset and going right up to the syllable like that. And so that's eel. Okay. The peak in sonority is not always a vowel, I should point out. In some syllables, in some languages, we have peaks in sonority that are, uh, they can be nasals. Uh, so we think of uh, a word like mm, rhythm, rhythm, Vm, that you could think of as having a nasal, um, a nasal peak in sonority, uh, or bird. Uh, if you count that er as a, a consonant, then that is a, a syllabic consonant, and it will occupy the rhyme, and it'll be the peak in sonority. Okay, I'm gonna check the chat to make sure that I'm still. I've got everyone. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah, lengths, angsts, not a total rhyme, but it's close. Um, at least not for me. Maybe it is for other people. Okay, so we have, but we've been dealing with rhyme and onset. And the rhyme is obligatory, the onset is optional. Okay, 
So we have talked about hierarchical structure at the level of the syllable. Now I think we need to figure out how to use this app again so that I can delete things or as I always like to say this, I hope that you find this part of the, uh, the charm is watching, watching someone struggle. There's a certain sort of joy associated with that sometimes. Um, okay, back to the, back to the action. So within the rhyme, there is also structure. So we've been talking about the peak of uh, sonority within a syllable. Uh, that actually, that peak has a name, and that is called the nucleus. So we can, we can do that. We can avoid doing that, hopefully. Um, there we go. So we have something like the nucleus. And the nucleus is this peak of sonority. So we have two components within the syllable rhyme, the nucleus, and what else? We have the coda. The coda. And the coda is all of those consonants that follows uh, that follow the um, the nucleus. So in this syllable strengths, we have an onset, a rhyme, which contains a nucleus and a coda. Okay. The coda is optional, but the nucleus is not. So we can get um, we can get syllables without a without an onset. We can get syllables without a coda. What would be an example of a syllable without a coda? Let's see if I can take some of this real estate. We could have one like B. So that's B, no coda, um, just a yeah B or T. That's another good example. Uh, so we, here we have an onset, but no coda. Um, so hopefully that is uh, relatively straightforward. Then once we have this language of onset, nucleus, and coda, we can start to slice and dice uh, syllables in other ways. So we can distinguish between syllables that have a coda and syllables that don't have a coda. And these, um, these two types of syllables tend to pattern in different ways across languages. So we have good concise names for them. If a syllable contains a coda, like eel or strengths or goes, we are going to call that a closed syllable. And if a syllable contains no coda, like B or T, then we're going to call that an open syllable. So we have closed and open syllables. Okay, there's something else. <laughs> something else that we can discuss, which is a distinction between light and heavy syllables. And this is not identical to the distinction between closed and open syllables. But to explain this, I'm going to need a new word. And you are going to see me struggle very briefly, hopefully very briefly. Nope. Okay. We're going to take this, get rid of it, Put in the nice black background again, brilliant. Then get ourselves back to the red. Okay, so then we have situations where you have long vowels or diphthongs as the nucleus of a syllable. So I'm going to, this, I need to take us down a little detour before we get to open versus closed. So we might have something like by and bit. So forget about strengths. This is something like by and this is something like bit. So if we were to make our little syllable trees for these, we have the onset, which is b in both cases. And then we have the rhyme. The rhyme is i in the case of by and it in the case of bit. In the case of bit, the, we have a branching below the rhyme into nucleus and coda. The nucleus is i, the coda is t. So we have a closed syllable. In by, we have a diphthong. 
and we have no coda because the sonority peak is the whole diphthong I. So we have a nucleus only, but the nucleus itself branches. So this nucleus, this node in our tree here, this node in our tree dominates two segments, I. So what the heavy versus light syllable concept allows us to do is to treat these two things, by and bit, as the same kind of thing. And so a heavy syllable is a syllable in which there is a branching nucleus, sorry, a branching rhyme, whether that is a branching nucleus or a branching uh, rhyme into nucleus and coda. So closed syllables and syllables with long vowels or diphthongs behave the same with respect to this light heavy distinction. The only things that don't behave um, this way are open syllables with short vowels. Um, so this would be something like ah in English. We have this schwa, which is no onset, no coda, just just the uh, nucleus of a short vowel, which is schwa, and that would be a light syllable. Heavy and light syllables. Sorry, I'm going to have to clear my throat. Yes, heavy and light syllables matter for a lot of uh, things like stress assignment in different languages. So if we look at the stress assignment rule for uh, Latin, for instance, we see that the it, it cares whether a syllable is uh, heavy or light. And so that's important there. So I think that basically deals with what we need to do for, uh, for syllable structure. So basically what we've been talking about here is is the structure of syllables and how they work. So if you hear me talk about this language does not allow um, closed syllables. This language <clears throat> cares about syllable weight, has a heaviness versus lightness. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Or if I talk about codas and this kind of thing. 